Thank you very much for this nice introduction. Um, do you hear me all right? Okay. Um, I guess you've had dinner and you've had dessert and uh, it's kind of late in the day, so you may feel a bit sleepy and pass out during the lecture. Don't worry. I was up all night because my son graduated, and, and in Sweden you, you generally give a, a large party, sort of, when your children graduate. So I was up all night, and then I flew out early in the morning. So if anyone will fall asleep, it's me. <laughs> but don't worry, just wake me up if I fall asleep, <clears throat> and I'll continue. Um, I guess, I mean, you're, of course, interested in how brains work and how brains deal with information. Uh, I'm kind of interested in the same thing as well, because I want to know how, how animals deal with visual information, how they pick up visual information through their eyes, and how they can generate behaviors through um, that information that they pick up. But I haven't really studied humans very much, a uh, little bit actually, but not very much at all. I've studied all sorts of other animals, anything from uh, jellyfish to man, and even, even things that are not animals. You'll see halfway through the lecture that even plants can see things. Not, a, not all plants, um, not that one over there, uh, but there are some, <laughs> some organisms that could actually be classified as plants that have uh, something we could properly call vision. Anyway, if you want to work out how visual information is processed, how that can lead to and generate behavior, uh, it's actually pretty good, I think, to have a more general view, not, not a human-centered view of how vision works. And um, so that's what my lecture is much going to be about, what actually animals use their, their eyes for, how eyes work, what the limits are of vision. Then we're going to look towards the end of the lecture a little bit about how they actually process information. Right, so of course, you all, you all know that um, the image that an eye will see is pixelated. We've got photoreceptors in our retinas that will pick up a pixel image pretty much like a digital camera. But it's actually not very correct to believe that it's just pixel values that goes into the brain, that the brain has this matrix of pixel values that it can make face, face recognition and things from. That's not correct at all, because that's basically, we never, there is never an image like that. There is an optical image like that on the retina, but there is never a neural image like that. We'll get back to that later. but. Um, the optical image, uh, if we look at some other animals, like this little dragonfly, actually not a little dragonfly, it's one of the rather large species. Um, they've got compound eyes like other insects, and um, crustaceans have compound eyes too. Um, does anyone know what, what the world looks like through a compound eye? <laughs> Gary Larson had an idea. <coughs> But it's not a correct idea. That's not the, what the world looks like. It's not one complete image behind each facet. It's rather the other way around. Each facet actually represents one pixel. It's just that there is a private lens for each pixel in the image in insect compound eyes, uh, which is uh, kind of not really a very clever solution because the limitations to how much information you can get in through an eye um, depends on uh, diffraction, which is given by the size of the aperture through which you pass light. So that's the size of the facet, or the size of our pupil. That's one of the limiting factors. The other one is photon shot noise, the uh, random arrival of photons. And that, of course, the number of photons you can get in in any integration time depends on the size, again, of the aperture. So if you have available, for making an eye, a certain space, then the most clever thing to do is to make one aperture to pass in all the light through. If you divide your world into different parts, so you look at that part through one lens and that part through another lens, that's not quite such a good solution, right? And if you make that, push that solution to its extreme to have one, pix or one lens for each pixel, then that, that, that's actually the most stupid possible eye you can make. All insects have the most, actually not all of them, we'll see that, that some, some have actually fixed the problem, but compound eyes are um, inherently stupid. Um, so it's not really, the, re the reason insects are so successful is not because of their compound eyes, it's despite their compound eyes. 
probably because of their wings. Um, but this difference between camera type eyes that we have and compound eyes, it really is, is an extreme difference when you try to push the designs. But early on, early in evolution, when before you actually start to add lenses and things, then the difference isn't that major, it's hardly any difference at all. So it's easy to understand how evolution could actually start on, on different tracks like that. It only turned out in the end that that track didn't lead very far in terms of performance. That track led to much better performance. So in fact, if uh, we had compound eyes and were to see as well as we do with our camera eyes, then those compound eyes would have to be about one meter in diameter. But they, of course, would have to have more facets than drawn here, because they should have the same number of facets as we have pixels in our eyes. By the way, do you know how many pixels we've got in our vision? Five megapixel, that's as any others bets. Well, it's actually just about one, about one megapixel. And that's for the two eyes together. So it's less than one for each eye. And if you compare that to a camera, if you take a camera with a zoom lens, and you can zoom in on something, and you see that even on the zoomed in thing, you can look at it with your naked eye and say, I can see those details. And you look at the image, now I can't quite see them in the camera. Um, and then you have a really narrow field of view. And you can zoom out to get a large field of view. So your, your eye seems to do everything. The good reason they do it is, of course, that we have high spatial resolution in the particular direction we look at. So we sample really densely in one small part, and then we have much coarser sampling for the rest of the visual field. Cameras don't do that, not yet at least. Um, and then, of course, we have to move our gaze around. But it's amazing how, how we still have the impression that the world has the same spatial resolution wherever we point our gaze. So if you look in that direction, you think it looks sharp there, but of course it's equally sharp there when I look there. Yes, it is. <coughs> but of course, then you have moved your, your gaze. Um, there are some insect eyes that actually do a bit better than that stupid solution. Um, some insects have what is called superposition eyes, um, which is optically a really complex structure with um, optically very uh, complicated little uh, lenses under each facet that uh, works as a little telescope. So it produces an intermediate image inside, and that image is imaged again, such that an inverted image becomes an upright image, and the over overall image in compound eyes is always upright. And if you superimpose upright images onto the overall upright image, then it works again. So that solution actually fixes the problem with a small uh, or the low, the small area to, to get uh, photons in. So photon noise is reduced by having uh, large areas of, of uh, facets cooperating like that. It doesn't solve the problem with diffraction. <clears throat> so they can see that a large aperture, one of those superposition eyes of, of insects. Then just some uh, little interesting insects. This is a male mayfly. It has got these, the poor type of apposition eyes. They're looking for general things in the world. It has got three camera type eyes looking at the horizon, which they use for, for flight stabilization. And I've got one pair of compound eyes looking straight up. These ones are superposition eyes, these ones are apposition eyes, and those are camera type eyes. So they've got, the head is just packed with eyes. Um, and this is a male mayfly. Females look exactly the same except these large yellow superposition eyes because they are used by the males to find females. They've got no other purpose. Uh, and they are actually, they are sensitive to ultraviolet, and they look towards the sky. Uh, the sky is always very homogeneous in ultraviolet, so it's a very, it's a wonderful background to spot dark silhouettes. Uh, so the males try to, they tend to fly really low, close to the ground, and they look for females that fly a bit higher. As soon as they see them, they fly up and grab them, and uh, uh, I guess that would be classified as a rape, but that's how they do it. <laughs> Now, I want actually to divide vision into two major different types of vision. Uh, I, would call it, I will call it low resolution vision and high resolution vision. Um, there are large groups of animals that can do low resolution vision. And then just actually 
at least taxonomically in, in terms of which animals are related to one another. There are just three groups of animals that can do high resolution vision. We belong to them. Animals that do high resolution vision, they can also do low resolution vision. And when I say high and low resolution vision, and I actually don't mean um, there is not a particular type of spatial or, or value of, of um, spatial resolution which um, differs between them. It's just that the, di the tasks are different. Low resolution vision, when I say that, I mean uh, any kind of visual task that is based on seeing dead things around us, things that are stationary and dead. Uh, those are the kinds of ta visual tasks that tells us that we move, we can see the motion flow field and determine our own motion in relation to the environment. Um, we use that in order to, to also to negotiate a path, not to walk into objects, actually find clear path. Even animals that swim or fly have the same kind of abilities. They have to find the place where they can actually continue to move through the environment, and that is based on what I would call low resolution vision. Am I walking in and out of the camera all the time? Yeah. And then I'm sort of out of focus, and then I'm in focus, and then, I, yeah, that'll be an interesting video. <coughs> <laughs> I don't know how to stay put in one place. Um, so let's take a look at some of the animals that can just do the low resolution tasks. Because the high resolution tasks are everything that uh, are involved with seeing other animals. If it's uh, animals that can eat you, predators, or animals that you can eat, or if it's mates that you may have uh, sex with or something like that, um, those are all high resolution visual tasks. So when we look at each other and talk to each other, that's a high resolution visual task. We can read our faces and, and all that. So that's high resolution visual task. But there are animals that can just do low resolution vision. And uh, some of the examples, you can show here, uh, that's a flatworm. Haven't got much in terms of eyes, but there is a pair of eyes there. Even jellyfish, that's a box jellyfish. You can see some little dark structures there, which are actually eyes. They've got four sets of eyes, altogether 24 eyes. Um, that's a ragworm. It's got two pairs of eyes on its head. Um, even starfish, at the tips of the arms, there are little compound eyes, which they use for low resolution vision. So these things are not good enough for, uh, for reading text, driving cars or anything like that, but it will actually help the animals to move to the right place in the habitat. They don't see each other. Their spatial resolution is not good enough to see each other. They use vision to move to the right place, mo move to a, a, a place where they can actually find food, but not by, find, not by seeing the food. Uh, they can also, if the environment is unfavorable in any way, uh, make sure they move in a straight line because that's the best way of getting out of an unfavorable place. If you move randomly, you tend to stand, stay very much in the same place all the time. So if you want to go to another place, you should move straight. And uh, then you can use vision to orient in a straight line. That's what many of these animals do. Um, if we look at their eyes, this is the, the eye of the flatworm. It contains, that's a pigmented little cup, uh, and these are light-sensitive cells. These comb-like things are actually the light-sensitive parts of the cells. There may be anything from, depending on the species of the flatworm, there may be anything from 5 to 40 or 50 of these cells, but there are no lenses or anything. So, of course, a cell over in that direction measures light in a rather large angle in that direction. That cell measures light in a rather large angle in another direction. It's not particularly acute vision. It's not lots of de details in it, but it's good enough uh, for these low resolution tasks. Hmm. Here's another little creature. It's called a velvet worm. These are the little eyes, camera type eyes. Um, actually, that's the rear end. It's got no eyes. Um, so they've got one pair of these little eyes, and by doing uh, optical measurements of the refractive index of the lens and the cornea and uh, the retina and everything, um, we can trace rays and see how it behaves when uh, you send light through it. 
we can use that to generate uh, visual fields of each individual light sensitive cell in the retina. As you see, light is actually never focused here. Light is actually focused behind the eye, so it's not a particularly beautiful eye in that respect. Uh, but it is possible to calculate exactly what these animals see. And we can make a filter uh, that blurs the, wor the world to exactly the same resolution as these animals have. And then we can apply that filter to images that we have recorded in the natural habitat of these animals. And uh, then this is what you see. That's the natural habitat in, in Australia, in an Australian um, eucalypt forest where these creatures live. They live, stay under rotten logs and things during the day because they are sensitive to drying out, so they have to hide in the day. They are out in uh, dusk and dawn to um, hunt for other insects, and they spray glue on the insects, so they don't actually use vision much to, to find their prey. Uh, but they, um, they need to find their way back to big logs and things in the morning when the light starts to come. Because otherwise, if they are still out in the open, they will dry to death. And with that kind of resolution, that's the resolution of the total visual field of a velvet worm. And you can see at the same distance, that's two meters from a log, where under that log there happen to be lots of them uh, staying during the day. And at two meters distance, you can actually discriminate objects like that. So they have enough spatial resolution to do those kinds of tasks. Uh, it will actually lead them to, r the, to the right place. They will find their way out in the morning. They can look for uh, bright openings and move towards them. And they can find dark uh, refugees, um, in, or, or refugees in, the, in the day. Another animal, this is a box jellyfish, which has got uh, four little structures, you see one structure there, it's actually suspended in a, you can see these structures keep their orientation all the time, each of these structures has a number of eyes on them, if we, but actually these, these guys don't have a brain, uh, there is a ring nerve, actually in, in a sense there is a brain, there is a neural center in these little structures where all the eyes are and then these communicate with the ring nerve. And this ring nerve is sending out motor neurons to the muscles in a rather diffuse manner. But they can still perform rather clever, visually guided behaviors with this equipment. Uh, so this is what each of these little, they've got four of these structures suspended in each uh, uh, long sides of their, their bell. Uh, that's the little stalk where it's suspended and they've got one eye, camera type eye, looking upwards they have got one camera type eye looking obliquely downwards, and since they are suspended in a flexible stalk, they always point in the same direction. So even if the jellyfish is swimming on its side or even swimming upside down, that little eye is always looking upwards, and that is always looking obliquely downwards. So that, that's an eye that tells them about the underwater world. That's an eye that looks up through the water surface and tells them about the world above the water. So what on earth would a jellyfish want to know about the world above the water? Well, it turns out these guys actually live in um, mangrove swamps, and they want to be close to the edge of the mangrove swamp. They want to actually see some mangrove uh, branches and things above them, because then they're in an area where there is lots of food for them. They can't see the food, but they want to stay in that area. If they drift away from that, they can use their upward pointing eyes to see that all the branches and things are coming to one side of their visual field, and then they know they have to swim back in that direction. So they actually use that to guide them, to keep them in the right place. These large eyes m are mainly used to um, make them avoid uh, swimming into obstacles. There are lots of branches and things which, with nasty things on them, so, which they don't want to swim into, and they avoid doing that. So they have, uh, and they do that through these large eyes. Then they've got another pair of lensless eyes, which we don't quite know what they use it for yet. Anyway. Um, this is what a box jellyfish would see if it went on a roller coaster ride. Um, that's, I know you've wondered about that all your life. Yeah. You'll fin uh, finally be able to see what they actually see. So that's, the, that's an animation of a roller coaster ride. It's not even a, roller, a real roller coaster ride. Uh, and that's what, uh, what the box jellyfish will see. You can see each individual photoreceptor in their, in their vision. Um, so if we can see if we can start this thing. 
Um, the responses that we get back is actually modeled also according to, because we've measured electrically from the photoreceptor cells, so we know how fast they are, how fast they adapt. So you can see the sky, which doesn't move, is adapted away. Uh, because we've modeled exactly the correct temporal properties of the photoreceptor cells in the retina. So they wouldn't see the sky, the clouds of the sky, since they don't move. But when the sky suddenly starts to move, which happens up here, then suddenly the sky becomes visible. Otherwise, the eyes filter away things that move too fast, because they can't handle fast things. They filter out things that are too fine in spatial detail, because they can't see those things. So it's actually... a a rather powerful filter that picks out the things that are, contains the most in information to them. And uh, the total amount of information, the number of pixels in this eye is about 1,000. So it's uh, a thousand times less than in a human eye. Although these eyes are much less than a millimeter large, so they are really tiny. Uh, but it extracts exactly the amount of information they need to perform their visually guided behavior. Not more and not less. I'm not quite sure if they... Uh, do you think they would enjoy their right? If you cover the lower panel, you've got no idea what's going on, I think. I think the concept of roller coaster ride may be uh, beyond the scope of the jellyfish mind, anyway. Uh, there are some animals that do even weirder things, um, like this guy. That's a fan worm, uh, which has got these nice plumes which they filter seawater through and uh, the fan worm actually sits in a, in a clay tube so it, it doesn't move around it sits in its entire life in this tube uh, and on one of the tentacles there is a nice little compound eye or actually not one on, on two of the tentacles there are nice little compound eyes what would they use compound eyes for well it turns out that they are of course uh, threatened by fish fish wants to eat this and they're really good at spotting fish at long distance. As soon as the fish is moving towards this or, or come close to, to the worm, uh, these eyes detect it and the whole thing just pulls back into the tube. It goes in a fraction of a second. It just looks like they disappear. And there's nothing for the fish to eat. So these are not actually, they look very much like eyes, but they are not. They are just burglar alarms. Because if you look at the brain, how these because these uh, photoreceptor cells that are in here, they actually feed in through the tentacles into the brain. But they never form any kind of uh, spatial map in the brain. Because, of course, it's in unimportant to these animals to know where the fish is. Because the animal can pull back into the tube just in one direction. So if the threat comes from there or there, the response will be exactly the same. They've got one visually guided response, pull back into the tube. Nothing else. That's the only visually guided behavior they have. And it's unimportant to be able to do that, to know where the threat is coming from. So I wouldn't say that they have vision. They have, a, um, they have multiple uh, directional photo or shadow detectors. So it's not really an eye. There are actually a number of animals that do things like that. Um, this is a Christmas tree worm. You can see it up there. There's another worm which form these nice Christmas tree-like things. At the base down here, you can see this boomerang-shaped large compound eye. It's another, the same thing. It's also used to pull the, the things back into. They don't make clay tubes, but they burrow and make little holes in corals where they sit and protect themselves. Uh, some clams do the same thing. You make scallops that you fancy eating, I guess. Sometimes they have these little blueberry-like eyes, which are based on, on um, reflective optics. So it's actually a mirror that creates the image. They use those for exactly the same purpose. They can close the shell when there is a threat coming. Uh, some other clams have lensless compound eyes, like that one. So, uh, but in all these cases, there is no image in the brain, because these guys don't really if you have a shell, you can't really close the left part or the right part. You close the shell, period, and when there is a threat and you can't do anything else. You don't need to know where the threat comes from. So these th things are, they may look like eyes, but really they are not. And we shouldn't say that they are low resolution eyes or high resolution eyes, because if anything, they would be on their way to high resolution vision because they actually look at other animals. That's what they're for. But now let's go to the high resolution eyes. Um, 
animals that have high resolution vision is uh, vertebrates, so that includes fish, um, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, us. And um, so that's one of the groups. Another group are the uh, arthropods, which includes insects, crustaceans, and spiders. So that's one group. Now we have two groups that have high resolution vision. Uh, there is actually a third group, and that are the, uh, that's the cephalopods, or in other words, octopus, uh, squid, and cuttlefish. They have large camera type eyes, and they have high resolution vision. But those three groups of animals are the only animals that actually have high resolution vision, and actually have brains that can see and detect other animals. All the other animals don't see other, other animals. They just see blurred images of their surrounding to move them to the right place. Uh, so how, how much does a cat see? Anyone have an idea? Pretty much, yeah. They actually, we're going to demonstrate it. Then you may wonder, what does this dragonfly then see? They have about 30,000 um, facets so that's in each eye. So that's 30,000 pixels compared to our million pixels in our vision. Um, and what about a little fruit fly, which has about 600 facets in each eye? That would be 600 pixels. Not particularly impressive. We're actually going to compare it by um, looking at an image. Uh, now, this actually happens to be a Swedish princess. Um, and the resolution of the image on um, my computer here, and it's actually reproduced fairly well through the projector. The resolution is the, uh, carries the amount of detail that a human eye can see in another human's face at one meter's distance. So now, now, now it's bigger than a, than a normal human eye, so you can actually be further away and see the same amount of spatial detail. But that's just a way of sort of calibrating the image. Now we can do the same thing, the image, with, uh, and ask what a cat would see. Uh, and now we completely ignore the fact that we actually have high resolution just in one point, and not over the entire image. Cats have the same thing. They also have a point of high resolution and much lower resolution around that. We completely ignore that and just as we pretend that this high resolution part was covering the entire visual field. So that's what the cat would see. Did you see any difference? Human, cat, human, cat. Oops, and that, uh, I just accidentally flicked over to dragonfly. Human, cat, dragonfly. The compound eye, even though it's a really big compound eye, uh, apparently is not extremely uh, good. But what, what about the little fruit fly then? We know that the size of eyes, the smaller you make them, of course you have less Less space means that you will suffer more from diffraction, you will suffer more from photon shot noise. Uh, let's see what the fruit fly sees. <laughs> and you would say, oh, blast, they don't see anything at all. Um, can they have high, is that high resolution vision? Yes, it is, but that's about um, the lowest resolution limit for high resolution vision. Fruit flies actually do sit opposite one another at, at a few body lengths distance. Human, uh, not human body lengths, uh, fruit fly body lengths, uh, towards each other, and they, they wave their wings and they communicate visually. They see that. They can also know when they are going to land, they can see the objects and extend their legs and things like that, which is actually a lower resolution vision, visual task. But anyway, they do high resolution vision, and uh, their spatial resolution, the smallest things that they can see are about six degrees. Human vision, uh, we can see a sixtieth of a degree. Um, but we are among the best animals as well. There are very few animals, apart from a few birds of prey, that can beat us. Um, human spatial resolution is uh, exceptionally good for some reason, possibly because we evolved um, the ability to manipulate objects and uh, make tools and things. That may be one of the reasons why we humans have really pushed the spatial resolution to extreme limits. Um, here you have a little uh, hunting spider. Uh, you see these large eyes, it's got, they've got eight eyes, I've got one pair on the side up there as well, but these large eyes they use mainly for hunting. The different eyes here have different roles, uh, which ac actually makes it important and kind of interesting in terms of um, 
their information processing because these eyes are, made, uh, are uh, specifically engaged in prey uh, pursuit. So they have all the processing that, is, that you need for prey pursuit in the brain areas that um, photoreceptors from these, from these eyes feed into, whereas photoreceptors from these eyes are not used at all for prey pursuit. They use it for general orientation, basically for low resolution visual tasks. They feed into other brain centers. They are processed completely separately. Not like in our eyes, where we have all the information for, for all our tasks through the same optic nerve. Um, <coughs> I can show you a bit, uh, images that were taken really long, long ago, uh, ophthalmoscopic images, so you can actually look into the spider eye, because there is a reflective layer behind the retina, so we can send an image in, and you may be able to see some little pixel-like things. These are the photoreceptors, you see individual photoreceptors. And um, the thing that looks like a baby there is actually a photograph of a baby. We didn't take a real baby and put it into the setup. <coughs> but we can, the good thing is we can make theoretical uh, calculations of how much animals can see if we know the, the amount of light in a particular environment and we know how big the eyes are and how large the apertures are. We can calculate where the limits are. Um, we can also make these indirect methods that I showed you before with ray tracing and, thing and things and see how, how acute the, the image actually is. And those type, completely different types of calculations actually agree. And they also agree with these uh, direct optical techniques where we can actually look into the retina and directly see how sharp the image is. Again, we can make a fourth type of measurement and that is behavioral experiments to work out how acute vision is. And all those methods generally return the same kind of results. So we're pretty w sure about how well different animals see. We know an awful lot less about what they actually do with the information, how their brains process it. Um, <coughs> this is one of these little day-flying uh, moths that feed from nectar in flowers. They have a long sucker that they stick into the flower while they're still flying. And even if the flower moves in the wind, they are able to see that, and they, they follow the flower to, to keep their sucker nice in, in, in the same place all the time. They do that with uh, tactile feedback or from the sucker, but also visual feedback. So if we suddenly turn the light off or something like that, or provide them with the false visual stimuli, they will follow the false visual stimuli and do the wrong thing. Uh, we can actually look, look into these eyes as well. Uh, exactly the way we did with the spider eye. It's not a baby now, it's a grown-up Danish TV reporter, which we also took a photo of and then put into the equipment. We didn't, we don't, there's not actually not space enough to put in Danish TV reporters in the setup. That's why we had to do it that way. It was done a long time ago before we had, to, uh, nowadays you do it, of course, with this little uh, display, but you couldn't do that in those days. These are kind of Bronze Age <coughs> experiments. Uh, so I said before that some creatures have vision that were actually not animals. These are the ones. Dinoflagellates, they're little single-cell algae. Um, they live all over the oceans. Uh, there are many, many more of those than there are animals on this planet. Uh, and some of the species of these dinoflagellates actually have something that looks like an eye. You can see that, so this is the cell. Uh, you can see that inside the cell there is something lens-like and something dark pigmented, very much retina-like. It turns out that that actually is a retina. Uh, that is a lens and that is a retina. And they use these things to guide <coughs> uh, their swimming. And that is actually high resolution vision because they hunt for other things, other relatives of them. Uh, other dinoflagellates mostly, that do not have, not all species have eyes. They hunt for other species and they see them as a dark silhouette against the downwelling light that comes down. And they move towards it. They grab the other cell and suck it dry. So, even though I'm a professor of zoology, it's kind of embarrassing to have to admit that plants, there are many more plant eyes than there are animal eyes. These are also actually the smallest eyes that are known. Because these are about five to eight micrometers across these lenses. 
So they're definitely the smallest eyes that are around uh, <coughs> among living creatures. Can't even say animals now. Uh, the largest ones are found in uh, giant squid. Um, you don't often see giant squid because they live at 1,000 meters depth or, or below. Um, they very rarely come up to the surface. It occasionally happens that they get up to the surface, but then it is because they've died down there and they're slowly being decomposed and uh, developing gases in their tissue, and that, which makes them float up. So when they are in a, in a rather rotten state, they reach the surface. Uh, then they may be drifted ashore and uh, washed up on some shore, and then um, a couple of days later, some tourists come and discover it. A couple of days later, again, the journalists are there and take photographs of it, and uh, a week later, the museum people come, and they pick this rotting crap up and uh, put, it, put it in big containers. So we tried to work out how big these eyes were, so we went to different museums to see what they had. It was all just rotten stuff. Yeah that they have pickled. But <laughs> we actually found a place where <clears throat> a guy had taken a photograph of a live uh, giant squid that was being eaten by pilot whales. So it had much of its body eaten away. Uh, many of the tentacles were off, but the eyes and head was intact. And he pulled it up in his boat. And you can see the eye there. Uh, this was done in America. And in America, there are standard dimensions of the, on those fuel hoses that goes from the petrol tank there. So that's the scale bar, and it turns out that that pupil is 9 centimeters, 90 millimeters across, and the whole eye is 27 centimeters. Those are the biggest eyes in the animal kingdom, by far. Uh, if we look at other eye sizes, these are the eyes of other animals that live in, in water, and the largest ones you find, apart from the giant squid, are uh, the eyes you find in really large swordfish, the eyes you find in blue whales, and the eyes you find in other uh, large squid, which are not giant squid. They reach up to that size, which is about the size of an orange, 10, 12 centimeters, or something like that. So that. And there is a reason, actually, for not making eyes larger than that. And then you can find every eye size down to really, really tiny eyes, less than a millimeter, depending, in, especially in small animals. Uh, the reason eyes don't grow larger than an orange is that there is actually a law of diminishing returns, which says that if you increase your eye size, you can see things further away. But if you live in the sea because of the absorption and scattering in the water, uh, it means that when you have made your eye pretty large, you can see really far away. And if you make it larger still, you can only see a little bit further away. So you, maybe you invest, say you, you make the eye 10% larger and you see 0.1% further away. So <clears throat> this law of diminishing returns may, says that it doesn't really pay to make the eye larger when you have uh, reached this size of about the size of an orange, except, of course, giant squid don't know about that rule, it seems, so they make eyes that size. We did lots of calculations on that to try to work out how that worked. What on earth is the reason why, can, why some animals make eyes that large when there is such a law of diminishing ret returns that really says they wouldn't see anything at all uh, extra <laughs> with that eye size than they would with the, uh, that eye size. But it turns out that they're They've got a very specific reason for having large eyes. They are uh, eaten by sperm whales, these very large uh, um, toothed whales that hunt for a giant squid and other squid uh, at really, uh, really far down, a thousand meters or even further down. <coughs> they hunt for them. They use a, um, a sonar, so they don't actually use vision to, to see the giant squid. At 1,000 meters, there is no daylight left. It's complete darkness down there in terms of daylight. But the sea is full of little planktonic creatures that actually emit, li emit light by luminescence if you disturb them. So if you plow through the water at 1,000 meters depth, uh, then you may see something like this for, for an approaching sperm whale. And that's a large target. And we did some calculations, actually did lots of calculations, and worked out that if the target is large, if you want to see something really large like a sperm whale, then it pays to make the eye larger. So those are the only animals that actually should have really large eyes. If you're interested in seeing smaller things at maximum distance, then you shouldn't have eyes that are larger than an orange. So everything makes sense. So now to color vision and your question about different animals, what kind of color vision they have. <clears throat> These peaks just rep so you've got the wavelength here, from uh, short wavelength blue light there to long wavelength red light there. 
That's the sensitivity peaks of uh, human color vision. We've got trichromatic vision, as you know, RGB. Um, blue there, green there, red there. Blue and green actually, or red and green overlap each other very much in human vision. Um, you wonder why? Is that useful to, does that actually bring the animal more information? Turns out it generally doesn't. It would be better to separate them evenly. Unless you're really interested in this specific area here to discriminate small color differences around 540, 550, 560 nanometers. Yellow, orange, reddish orange. We are particularly good in, in that region. Anyone have, I, and I have an idea why? Pardon? Yeah, but then there are lots of animals that should have it like this. Skin? No? no? Uh, we find it in humans and primates. So it seems to have, ha because mammals in general just have two, otherwise, have blue and green sensitive. So di uh, mammals in general, the dichromats, have just two basic colors, whereas humans and higher primates have three. And we have these peculiar double or, or very close peaks. And uh, the main general idea is that that evolved as a way of discriminating fruit, ripe fruit, against uh, a background of green foliage. And how is that? Then? Why do other animals still have orange? Um, that yeah, because probably because early primates were uh, fruit eaters. So they spe uh, specialized on climbing in, in, tr in trees and uh, trying to, to find fruit using the color signal of, of ripe fruit. So that's probably what early primates did, and we, have, we still have this weird kind of color vision because of it. Um, insects are normally trichromates, most of them. They have three peaks, but they are evenly separated. One in the ultraviolet, one in the blue, and one in the green. Um, that's really useful for most insects to find uh, each other and flowers and all sorts of information. Birds are tetrachromats. They have four different colors, four different types of, of color receptors in their retinas. So they can actually see, they cover about the same range as, um, as insects. They go a bit further up into the red and not quite as down, much down into the ultraviolet as insects do. But they separate this part of the spectrum into three, into four different classes instead. So they have a much more, in a way, a much more advanced type of color vision. Um, it's really hard to work out what they can see, but we've actually made cameras that are intended to see the world exactly the way birds do it. So we've uh, designed a special camera which has four types of pixels, and the spectral sensitivity of each of those pixels very, very closely mimics the spectral peak of each of the four classes. And then we can take that camera out into the real world and um, uh, take pictures or movies and see what birds actually see. <coughs> That's what a human would see. Uh, of course, we can't plug four different, we can't plug a, a tetrachromatic image into our brain because it will have to go through our trichromatic eyes. So no matter what we do, we lose one of the color channels there. We'll filter it down to a three-dimensional color world. But what we can do, we can actually take out of the four color channels we have, we can remove one at a time and convert the remaining ones to RGB. Then at least we can, we can then we have to look at four different images. And all four different images together will tell you what kind of information there is. And these are just two of the possible images, two of the four. Uh, and quite obviously, you can discriminate different things here that we, ca we can't really do. So birds, and, and it turns out that actually birds probably use ultraviolet reflections in, in uh, leaves and things. Um, turns out ultraviolet is much more reflected on glossy surfaces than other wavelengths. Um, in the ultraviolet, there is much less diffuse reflection, and it's dominated very much by glossy or specular reflections. And specular reflection says something about the quality of leaves and things. So maybe birds use that, which gives them more information about the vegetation, which may be interesting for them if they want to, to look for insects which like particular types of plants or so. They may be able to see those plants better than what we can do. Um, 
These guys, that's a cuttlefish uh, with a really weird pupil. Uh, they don't have color vision at all. They've got m just monochromatic vision. One type of receptor that in, in, it covers one color, but instead they have polarization vision. So they have two types of receptors. One that is, this is just a photo taken through a, a pair of polarized glasses, which preserves uh, only a light that oscillates in that plane. It cuts out all the light that oscillates in that plane. What cuttlefish do is that they have receptors that are specifically sensitive to light that oscillates in that direction and light that oscillates in that direction, and they use that as if it was two different colors. Uh, it's easy to take images of cuttlefish with um, a camera that mimics the same thing. So you actually take two images with polarizers uh, oriented in different directions. And you can put colors, false colors into that. And then their uh, tentacles, if you look at the cuttlefish from the front, will look something like that. Uh, we see something like that. But that is what they potentially would see. And the interesting thing is that they've got little crystals in their tissue, so they can actually change that pattern. We can't see the changes at all, but they can. So they've got a private communication channel. They can actually talk to each other by making patterns on their tentacles. We don't see a thing. Fish don't see a thing. But other cuttlefish, squid, and uh, octopus, they do see this pattern. <coughs> this is a really weird um, crustacean. It's called a mantis shrimp. They've got really bizarre eyes with uh, several lobes and a mid-band across, and they scan with this mid-band continuously. They, they scan the world with this mid-band independently with a left and right eye as well. So they, they look really weird when they go on scanning their world with these two eyes. So why do they do that? If we look into the eyes, it turns out that they haven't got three, they haven't got four. They've got 12 different types of uh, uh, color receptors. And apart from 12 different kind of color receptors, they can also discriminate the plane of polarization. And they can even discriminate linearly polarized light from circularly polarized light. So they've got a huge array of different types of photoreceptors that detect everything possible in, in, uh, in the light. But they've got rather tiny brains. How on earth can you have a 12-dimensional color vision system? You would need a huge brain. To, to get any, make any sense of that, but it turns out they don't bother comparing colors. They actually don't have color vision. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, what they do is, colors are really important to them. They have really bright colors. You see one of them here, the, the eyes are over there. They've got these appendages which look like rainbows. They've got all sorts of different colors there. Uh, there are many different species of them, and they are extremely aggressive. If um, they happen to approach one that is not uh, interested in having sex or so, it may be the last thing they do. <laughs> so it's re they need to be really, really, they need to know what kind of sex it is. Is it the right species? I is it in the right mood? Uh, and only then can it slowly approach and, and, uh, for the um, survival of the species. Uh, so they really have to be absolutely clear what kind of, of animal it is there that they are facing. And they do that by scanning these eyes with all these different receptors, and more like they, they work like a barcode. So for each of these receptors, there will be a particular pattern when it's scanned across. And if all uh, 12 of the color ones and all the polarization ones say the same thing, yes, it's the barcode of a female of that particular species, they may actually dare to advance. So they don't really have color vision. They just have a large number of monochromatic uh, uh, vision channels. Some other really amazing things is that um, even though the eye actually may pick up lots of things, it's not, not necessarily so that um, we see it very well. You, you probably have difficulties reading that. That is hardly, I've tried to make, the, make it isoluminant so that there is no luminance contrast. That is supposed just to be color contrast, but it's a really high color contrast. Our vision, is, our brain is useless in trying to see things at high spatial frequencies, which has just color contrast and no luminous contrast. On the other hand, we are pretty good at uh, seeing these things, which are no color contrast, but really low luminous contrast. We're really good at that. But do, we made experiments with chickens. We've tried other birds as well. Turns out chickens can't see that at all. Well, we've not asked the chicken to read. We've actually... <laughs> 
made experiments where, the, where we have targets with, with small contrasts and the, the chickens get uh, a reward if they pick, if they make a choice from the left or right, they get a reward by, by getting some food. And they, it turns out they can't see that at all, if, or <laughs> targets that have such low um, just luminance contrast, but they are really good at things like that. So if there is no luminance contrast but high, or any kind of color contrast, they see it immediately but they can't see luminous contrast. So it seems that mammals, in general, live in a colorless world. We see things as a luminance image, and then we color in the luminance image afterwards. Whereas birds, they, do, they really live in a color world. They completely ignore the, the luminance part. In fact, the luminance signal will have to be more than 20%. We can see less than 1% contrast. Birds, for birds, it will have to be more than 20% before they actually start to see it at all. So birds live in a rather different world to us. Not because their eyes are different in this respect, that's depending on what the brain actually picks out of the information that is available. Uh, you may have seen things like this, and uh, it looks like that is brighter than that, and that is darker still, right? No, it's not right. They, are actually, they actually have exactly the same tone of grey. You just see these little balls against different types of backgrounds, and you what your brain does is, that's exactly what I started in the first slide, that's pixel image, and then I said that you're not really uh, getting any information about absolute intensities. What your retina tells you, it's not your brain, it's your retina that tells you immediately that uh, these things are brighter to a certain degree than its immediate surrounding. So you just measure local contrast. And that's at the very first level, the first step of, of neurons in the retina picks out that. So the absolute intensities are gone. That's the first thing that the retina does, removes that. That information is irrelevant. It just costs lots of information. Actually, it's lots of information, but it's uh, useless information. So that's thrown away. And we just see the co local contrasts. And it's not even just the local contrasts in space. It's also local contrasts in time. So what, we, what our... Uh, neurons actually tell us is how much brighter something is compared to what it was just recently compared to its uh, immediate surrounding. And that the first step that happens in the retina, so all that information is gone. Uh, you can see the same thing there. That looks darker than that, but it, they, the, the, the two actually have exactly the same tone of gray. We can do the same thing with color. You may have seen this image before. Um, this kind of Rubik's cube, cube that has a yellow filter on top of it there and a blue filter on top of it there. And I actually claim now that that really dark blue here is the same level of grey as the yellow ones there. Do you believe that? Hard to believe, but if we put a mask on top. So that one now, that is the dark blue one, right? So they actually have the same color as the... Um, back like so, right. So they have exactly the same tone of gray as those do. You see those as yellow because you compare with the bl bluish general surrounding. You see those as blue because you compare it with the general yellow surrounding. And that's actually what your retina feeds your brain with. It's not something the brain works out. That's is, is, is information that is uh, fixed by the retina at once. Um, other things are... This looks like a really weird image. Um, it's actually not one. It's about 40 photographs taken with a fisheye lens, which covers 180 degrees, in an environment where the camera has been aligned such that the middle of the visual field uh, is always horizontal. And then we make an average image. So this is an, this is an average image of, of an environment. This happens to be sort of an open landscape with some trees and mainly grassy fields and things. Um, sky up there, that's the horizon, which is generally darker. Um, that's the, the ground. So this is a, a, the natural pro or the properties of natural scenes, which also affect how vision is, is uh, processed to a very large extent, because things you can see up here, there are different types of things that you see up there, 
than you see there. That's things that are very far away that may be relevant along the horizon. Um, things down here are close, close range. That may be relevant for completely different reasons that things are relevant that you're seeing in that sector. And things that you see up here com mean completely different things. So often animals have uh, their retina regionalized, so they actually do different types of processing in different parts of the visual field. The world has very different properties and contains very different types of information. At the moment, we're actually investigating zebrafish. And it turns out that that's the natural world of a zebrafish. Again, we've made lots of averages of it. And uh, we've also looked at the processing in the retina. And it turns out that zebrafish actually have color vision. They use uh, 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 chromatic contrast in the horizontal region. That's where, and we've looked at the, the statistics of these natural worlds. And it turns out that there is actually a lot of color information in the horizontal band. They don't use color vision down here. Then they use red biased luminance vision to get um, <coughs> the flow field so they can see how much they move in relation to the um, ground under them. Up here they also have um, uh, luminance vision, no color vision. They have uh, ultraviolet luminance vision which they use for detecting predators, which are generally birds. And you can see that in the retina because there are very different types of processing going on. The retina looks, and the neurons in the retina are actually rather different in the lower uh, horizontal and upper part. Another thing that might be interesting to think about is that uh, when our ancestors, about 350 million years ago, we had ancestors that lived in water. Um, and these fish looking something like that. In a rather short period of time, they, became, uh, they walked up on land and started to feed on animals, uh, on insects, uh, actually not insects, but feed on uh, myriapods and other arthropods that were around on land in those days. But it's an interesting thing to see what, what they actually faced. Their visual system, which when the, as long as they were underwater, they were living in a typical underwater world, which is very different to a terrestrial world. Underwater, you have this problem with absorption and scattering, which was the reason for the, uh, that you shouldn't make eyes uh, too large. That is actually a very important filter. It means that if you see something, it's usually of interest of some, in some way. It could be something that is threatening, could be a predator, it could be one of your own species that you want to be close to, or it could be uh, a food item. So if you see something, it's generally important. So it means that, that the, the actual environment makes most of the filtering for the animal. They don't need to do that in the brain. But if you get up on land, you face a completely different world with you can see really far away with huge amounts of clutter. So you're, a, you're supposed to see really small things moving on, uh, with this kind of, uh, of complex background, which puts a, com and a tremendously different um, task on the brain. So lots of things must have happened in the in visual processing in the brain when animals went from aquatic to terrestrial. And also it actually doesn't really pay to make eyes very large here because you get so much spatial structure that uh, there is no way you can sort anything out. You don't want too much spatial structure. So terrestrial animals don't have eyes that are as large as the ones that are aquatic for that particular reason. So how do animals actually then process information? Well, at the moment we are... Uh, starting to look into that by, um, by looking at uh, neurons that make decisions. And we use insects for that. Um, in the central part of the insect brain, we find neurons that are, there are very few of them, just small one or two or three, or each types of neuron. They seem to be involved in making decisions. So those neurons are activated when a particular behavior is initiated. If they're not activated, that behavior is not initiated. And when I say behavior, it's a very small module of a behavior. It's not a complete behavior with different kinds of, of motions, but <coughs> it's a small um, part of a behavior which is triggered by neurons that actually make decisions. And those neurons, of course, have lots of these um, switch neurons, have lots of input. Uh, there are a number of different stages before that where internal state because the, the animals may be hungry or not hungry they may be interested in different things uh, they may be tired they may be it may be 
reproductive station, they may be scared because they're in a really weird environment. All these things will determine which kinds of behaviors are likely to be turned on. So there are lots of different input to these decision neurons. And then these decision neurons directly turn on um, behavioral circuits which control individual muscles. And that seems to be the way animals generally do it. We don't control all the different muscles in a behavior through central brain parts. We have lower brain parts, motor brain parts, that contain all these circuits that can do particular behaviors. So walking, I don't think about how, how I'm going to... Yeah, you, you've got all hell with the camera there now. <coughs> um, when I move, I, when I walk, I don't think about how I control this huge number of muscles in my legs that I have to control. I don't think about that at all. Because that's all in my spinal cord. Instead, um, the legs are made user-friendly to the brain by, because of these circuits in the spinal cord. So they can just be turned on or off and control the body in a much better, easier way. Uh, now we try to look at that in insects. And uh, in, in, in the insect brain, this is the optic lobe. Uh, you've got the retina there. Uh, and there are three different uh, regions of the insect optic lobe where you have uh, what we call uh, a retinotopic organization. So you have cartridges which correspond to pixels or pixel areas. So there is actually the, the retinal image is preserved throughout this. But then the retinal image is not preserved in anything uh, in the rest of the, the brain. These are central brain areas. And here we find a number of these uh, decision neuron, neurons that uh, actually can turn on or off specific behaviors and also control the, the course, the direction an animal is moving. Um, the animal may actually have a desired heading. It wants to go in a particular direction. And then visually it gets information about if it is going in that direction or if, the, if it's actually starting to go in a slightly different direction, then it needs, needs to make a correction. So then we can have different types of current heading and desired heading uh, feeding into turn generators which can steer the animal. Uh, and that steering is then, it depends on what kind of uh, uh, attentional gates and other uh, switches are involved, which I eventually ends up in controlling a number of uh, motor circuits in the brain. Um, insect brains are good in that respect because they don't contain uh, 10 to the power of 11 neurons, they contain uh, about a million neurons. So you can much better, you can characterize each neur neuronal type and you can actually get down to the real circuitry. Uh, in a better way. So that's what we're trying to do uh, and we'll continue in the next couple of years, hopefully. Uh, but what we've learned through all these, I think, is that the reality is uh, it's, it's very easy to be human-centered and think that we see the real world. We see reality. The way we process it is, is the, way, the only way to do it. Uh, animals do it in so many different ways and it's so much dependent on what animals uh, how they live their lives, what they feed on and what are the um, threats in their life, the, what their environment looks like and so on. So that's um, one of the take-home messages. Um, I guess you may have any questions.